Good evening, everybody. You know by now, it, I'm German heritage, so I start on time, right? I have pointed this out last time. So for those of you who are new here today or may have forgotten, my name is Gerda Rieb, and I'm director of Global Programs, and I feel really honored that I'm um, able to host this great uh, series um, this year. So as you know, our subject, as it says right there, is Europe at the crossroads, and we're looking at social and political threats to European unity and why they matter here to us in the US. So today we are in the middle section there, March 7th, and our talk will deal with uh, post-Soviet politics in what's called the Visegrad Four countries. You'll know, you'll learn more about this, um, specifically Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. Um, so, and also looking at post-Soviet politics, the influence of Vladimir Putin, etc. So it should be quite interesting and enlightening. And as always, I really would like to thank our donors who make this series possible. So I'd like to start, first of all, with Alison Young, who is, uh, has the Theodore Chase Endowment Fund here on campus and contributes to, to be, us be able to bring in speakers from literally all over the world and the United States. We have a grant from Humanities Montana. I'm very grateful for that. We write that grant every year. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. So we got it this year. I'm very happy. I'd also like to thank the American Association of University Women and, of course, always our FECC alumni and friends. So without you, none of this would be possible. So I would like to just <laughs> applaud you all on, and thank you. So our speaker tonight is uh, one of FVCC's finest minds. Uh, Dr. Mullins earned her PhD in East Central European history at the University of Washington, and that was in 2013. She is also a Fulbright scholar and conducted research for a dissertation in Kosice in Slovakia, where she actually lived and worked for seven years. Um, her published works focuses on Eastern Slovakia's experience during the turning points in its post-war history, 1948, 1968, 1989. So some of you might have all these dates quite present still in your mind. I do, except for 1948. So... Um, <laughs> So at, um, as usual, a bit of housekeeping. At the end of her talk, Dr. Mullins will stick around and welcome folks to approach the podium for as long as she has energy and you know, left before you know, it's midnight or something like that. And she will we'll collect the questions as usual. I am gonna have this red box walking around. You all got question cards. If you need more, I have plenty more. So we'd like to you know, encourage you to write down your questions. She will read them out loud to get as many as possible in, and then again, stick around to approach the podium. So without further ado, as people like to say, I'd like you to warmly welcome Dr. Mullins. Okay, hello, good evening. <laughs> I, it's really an honor to be here um, with especially a hometown crowd. Um, I see some familiar faces out there, some students, um, perhaps some senior institute students of mine. Um, anybody uh, partaken in senior institute here? All right, okay. It's a great program that FBCC offers. Um, and so I'm excited to be here tonight to talk to you about a part of the world that has stolen my heart. Um, as Gerda mentioned, I lived for seven years in eastern Slovakia in the second largest city of the country named Košice. And um, I have no ancestral roots in the region, but um, began teaching English there and uh, ended up teaching uh, for the Slovak state, taught English at a Slovak high school. Um, and finally went back to do dissertation research. So, so anyways, um, I, I want to stress something that I'd like you to take away tonight, because I know that a lot of people say, what's the big deal? This is East Central Europe, communism's gone, aren't we in the clear? Um, but I guess that you're here tonight because you know that um, some things are happening in the region. Um, and so I'd like for you to take away the idea of what the far right political parties are doing in that part of the world, the power that they have, and why it matters to us, even here in America. So 
that hopefully will be what you walk out of here with. Um, and I know many of you remember, I, I can't help but bring this up, um, when the Sudetenland was given to Hitler as an appeasement in Mun at the Munich conference in 1938, um, it was Neville Chamberlain who said, why should we care about a people of whom we know nothing? And again, Sudetenland was given right to Hitler. So by being here tonight, you are learning about these people in East Central Europe. Okay, so let's get started. So we're talking tonight about a group of countries called the Visegrad Four, uh, known as Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. And uh, this year actually marks 30 years since the fall of communism. I c can you believe that? 30 years, 1989 to 2019. And so 30 years ago, um, these neighbors met in 1991 at the Visegrad Castle in Hungary, um, and they renewed their shared cultural bonds. They have intellectual values that are in common, common roots, and they formed a cultural and political alliance back in 1991. Well, at about this time in the early 90s, uh, Western observers voted these four as the, quote, most likely to succeed um, among countries in the region um, in that transition from a command economy to a free market economy and to democracy. So things should go great with these four. All of them joined. NATO joined the European Union. So far, so good. But today, however, um, these several of these countries, in particular Poland and Hungary, are actually known as the troublemakers of the European Union. And the European Union is really um, trying to figure out uh, how to keep these two under control. So we're going to talk today about why they are the troublemakers. All right. Um, I'd like to mention just another uh, thing as well, and that is that um, Freedom House did a study last year that notes that the democracy score of every country in Central Europe has declined in two th uh, since 2008. And again, there's many reasons for this concern, but when we look back to this part of the world and see that World War I, World War II, the Iron Curtain came down right through this region, um, it makes us um, pay attention, even here in Montana. So, all right, well, let's look at just a couple maps to get started. So you see here the country we're looking at is in the middle there, the blue, Central Europe. All right, my Slovak students, I used to teach at a Slovak high school, and they used to say Slovakia is the dead center of Europe. And, um, you know, if, depending on where you draw Europe, they, you know, they're kind of right. So, um, so these countries, um, I refer to them as East Central Europe, um, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. And here's a slide that shows a bit of the populist movement in the far right political parties in the region. Um, so this was as of January 2019. You see the, the, the red there stands for populist um, countries where a uh, populist administration is in power. We have Poland with the Law and Justice Party, Czech Republic with Ano, and Ano means yes in Czech and Slovak. Hungary has an alliance there between Fidesz and the Christian Democrats. They are also a populist alliance. And if you notice there, the one country that's not highlighted, but that's one of ours, is Slovakia. So I hope I get a chance to talk to you about why Slovakia um, is considered a mainstream form of government still and what they've done to resist um, the far right. So tonight, um, I'd like to keep your attention for hopefully five points. Um, we're gonna start with a brief historical overview of the region. We'll talk about some problems in the region and then how they arose and larger trends as well as ending with why it matters. Why does it matter to us? So um, it's important to note actually at the outset that 100 years ago, three out of the four countries we're talking about did not exist on the map of Europe. 100 years ago, three out of four of these countries did not exist on the map. That being Poland, which of course reappears on the map at the end of World War I in 1918. 
Um, it had been partitioned in the 18th century, but shows up back on the map. And then Czechoslovakia, of course, was created at that time by fusing the Czechs and the Slovaks together. Czechoslovakia um, has a, a troubled unity history. Um, they split in 1938 under pressure from Nazi Germany. And then they split again, as you probably know, in 1993, um, when the leaders of the two countries, Czech Republic and Slovakia, basically decided um, that's what would be best. So it's unfortunate because having lived there, I can tell you that many Czechs and Slovaks um, wish there had been a referendum, wish they had been allowed to vote on that decision, uh, because many wish they were still united today as Czechoslovakia. But um, they are split. And then our fourth country that we're looking at is Hungary. And I'll show you that here. So this is a, a map of the former Hungarian Empire. And you can see here um, how expansive it was. I'm going to show you another map in a minute that even makes this more clear. But basically, um, as a punishment for being part of the central powers, along with Germany in World War I, Hungary was carved up at the end of World War I in 1920. And it was reduced and cut down to size to the, the central part, which exists today, which is Hungary. Other states were formed out of it, okay? So you see Czechoslovakia, Romania, Yugoslavia. But Hungary actually lost two-thirds of its territory and three-fifths of its population in 1920. And this is still a very big deal to many Hungarians. Um, I was driving through Hungary not that long ago. Well, 2012, it's long ago now. But... Um, and we stopped at a gas station and went inside, and there's all kinds of booklets on the shelves. Like, we might see this kind of here, you know, Gettysburg and, you know, famous things that we look back to. Um, but there, the booklets are all about Trianon, which was the treaty that carved up Hungary. Um, you'll still see people there wearing, you know, leather jackets with this part of fractured Hungary on the logo. Um, this is very much in their minds. And actually, the Hungarians then um, called those peoples, those Hungarians that were stuck in somebody else's country, the irredenti, the unredeemed. Okay, that's where we get our word irredentism. So the goal was then to bring them back to the fold. And that's exactly what Hungary did when it um, joined up with Adolf Hitler. And he actually um, did give them back some of that territory. So I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But I want to talk um, as well, in, when we're on number one here, the historical themes, uh, the influence of the great powers. So these are themes that have been constant over the past 250 years in the region. So great powers being Germany, dating back to the Holy Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, if you remember the Turks at the gates of Vienna in the 1600s, Russia, even before it became the Soviet Union, has long been a player in this part of the world. And today, the European Union could arguably be a great power in the region there. So three out of four of these countries have always been part of somebody else's empire, with the exception of Hungary. Okay, They've been the little guys sandwiched in between. Well, the other theme um, that we see is the effort to catch up economically with the West. Um, this region has experimented with capitalism during the interwar period. Um, you know, the, these nations are created in 1918. They say, let's try capitalism. Um, unfortunately, the Great Depression happens, um, which is very disillusioning. Um, they try fascism for a while during World War II. And then communism. Again, the Red Army liberates this region. Um, it was the West that ceded the Sudetenland to Hitler, so they say, why not try communism? Um, and then today, um, the Eurozone, which is the single currency market with the Euro as the, as the monetary currency, Slovakia is actually the only one of these four countries that is on the Euro. So, And finally, when we're talking about history, would be nationalism. And I know you hear this word a lot, and my students do too. And so um, I brought in a slide to try and talk about um, 
what is nationalism? And we'll talk about populism as well. So here's one definition. Nationalism is an ideology appealing to common cultural traditions, language, religion, ethnicity or race, history, in order to build national pride, often at the expense of other nations or peoples, okay? So that's one definition of nationalism. And now let's look at populism. Okay, so populism being the belief that the people, I think the populace, are good, as opposed to the elite, quote, who are corrupt, all right? So it supports the underdogs or the ordinary people in their struggle against elitists. Now, interestingly, with these, um, with these definitions, the elite can actually um, be ma a malleable term. You can make the elite whoever you want them to be. Um, you can make them the economic elite, the political elite, the cultural, the academic elite, um, anyone who is seen as being insulated from the problems the everyday man has to face, right? Anybody in charge who's trying to shove their agenda down the throats of the ordinary people, that's kind of who, who the elite can be made out to be. And this concept we know is easily applied to the outsiders, okay? Whether outsiders be um, the European Union in Brussels telling these guys what to do, or the Syrian refugees um, that are flooding the borders and threatening our culture, um, our economy. And, and I would say really that both of these terms are valid descriptors for what we're seeing. Um, you see both of these phenomenon in the region. All right. Well, let me finish up here on history. So looking at one regional nationalism um, that was very toxic, we talked about the Austro-Hungarian Empire after World War I um, was broken apart, but mathematically, only six countries were newly created out of 10 to 12 ethnic groups that were within that Austro-Hungarian Empire. That means there were a lot of disgruntled minorities stuck in somebody else's country, in one of these six countries. And these splinter in World War II. Um, I'll show you here. Here's um, two maps. You see Europe before World War I on the left, uh, the huge uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire there in yellow. And then you see the creation after the war of, um, you know, Czechoslovakia comes on the map. Romania, Yugoslavia, Poland reappears. Um, so big changes, but you also had a lot of disgruntled minorities stuck in somebody else's land. So you see here in this kind of, uh, well, I don't know what color, mustard color that is, um, the Sudetenland. This was the Czech territory that was ceded to Nazi Germany at the Munich Conference in 1938. And again, the premise there was that Hitler said, um, you know, there's many Germans living in this part of Czechoslovakia, which there were, and they would rather be part of Germany. And so if you give me Sudetenland, Hitler said, I'll stop. And of course he didn't stop. Um, but this also happened in Hungary, the red at the bottom there, um, being, uh, all of, you know, all of Slovakia was former Hungarian territory. And so, in, um, in exchange for Hungary joining Hitler during the war, he rewarded them by giving them back that big chunk of southern Slovakia there in the red, um, which they got to keep um, during, the, during the war. So disgruntled minorities stuck in somebody else's empire. All right. Well, we're already at number two. We're doing good. Um, we're gonna talk about problems in the region. This is what I really want you to come away with tonight is what's the big deal? Why should we be concerned? Why should we pay attention? Um, and the main issue is the rise in the popularity and the power of the far right political parties. And these parties are actively resisting the rule of law and EU warnings, okay? So I'm gonna begin with Poland and Hungary because they're the troublemakers. Um, and I, I want to say at the outset, um, when I talk about far-right political parties, this is in no way in comparison to our far-right political parties here in America. Um, this is a whole nother ballgame in East Central Europe. 
um, and you know levels of corruption, all that kind of stuff makes our levels of corruption look like child's play. So, um, and you'll soon see why. So I am talking about a, a different um, part of the world. But I mention here the power of these parties. Um, and I say that because in Poland and Hungary, these parties control the prime ministership, the parliament, and they're actually changing policy in quite a radical way. So two ways they're changing policy. They are rejecting independent institutions as checks on government. Okay. So for example, Poland has subjected the judiciary branch to the whims of the ruling party. This, of course, corrodes the separation of powers at the government level. And secondly, they're cracking down on legitimate public criticism. Um, they're restricting freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the freedom to publicly demonstrate. So this includes, for example, in Hungary, suppressing the media, um, suppressing any civil society demonstrations, suppressing education. Uh, recently, Central European University in Budapest had to close its doors and move to Vienna because the government in Hungary purposely made it very difficult for them to operate, um, which is a, a, a shame. They suppress non-government organizations or NGOs. Basically, they say those who criticize um, the current administrations are smeared as agents serving foreign interests and harming the nation. Okay, so that's where we're starting. Um, let's look at Poland to get started. The leading party there is the Law and Justice Party, which has been the majority party since 2015. It's led there by Jarosław Kaczynski, um, and he is, um, he and his brother, his twin brother, were child actors um, under communism. And uh, his brother actually became the president of Poland, Lech. And Lech was killed along with other top heads of state in a plane crash that went down in 2010. I don't know if you remember, but um, in 20, it was, it was really quite tragic. Um, in 2010, the president, his brother Lech, as well as top Polish heads of state were on their way to Russian territory where there had been a Soviet massacre of Polish generals during the, the Second World War. They were on a Russian-made aircraft, the plane went down, and again, it knocks out all of your heads of state for the most part. Um, and so there, this um, led to a large conspiracy theory that Russia actually had had something to do with the plane going down. Um, I don't believe that's the case, um, but regardless to say it fed rumors of conspiracy theories, the Poles and the Russians have long had bad blood. And um, so Lech um, being gone, his brother is now head of this party. Um, and it's especially strong in the poor rural areas in the east. And this is a map of Poland. Um, actually, this map is showing the percentage of dwellings without indoor plumbing in Poland. Okay, so um, just a little tongue in cheek, but it, it's also corresponding to the areas where this political party is strongest. Um, so in the south and the east, in the more poor rural regions. So illiberal actions, what have they done? Well, um, again, they've abolished the independent judiciary. So based on laws passed in 2017, law, the law and justice dominated parliament controls the election of members to the National Judicial Council, which appoints judges across the country at all levels, okay, down to the local level of judges. And furthermore, um, these laws permit the replacement of about 40% of sitting Supreme Court justices, okay? So they're off the bench replaced with the selected ones from uh, this political party. As well as the fact that this newly dominated law and justice uh, judicial body validates elections from here on out. And of course, this used to be under the purview of uh, the independently elected Supreme Court. In addition to this, um, law and justice has taken control of state media, has limited the right to public demonstrations, restricted activities of NGOs, and I mention here Article 7 proceedings because the EU has initiated 
Article 7 proceedings against them. Um, and what that means is they've opened the door to sanctions against Poland, where they could with, you know, withhold the money that they've been so generously supplying them with, and it's, it's very generous. Um, this Article 7 also prevents that particular state, in this case Poland, from voting in EU Council decisions. Okay? Um, and I'll pick up on where we're at with this in just a minute, but I thought I'd show you, let me show you another slide here. And it says, what law and justice is attempting to do is revolutionary. The party is not just seeking to select its own judges and give them extraordinary powers. It is essentially, I think it's very indicative of the situation across all four of these countries. So it says polls fall short. This is the average annual earnings of a single person in 2014. Polls earn less than a third of the EU average. And Poland is there at the very bottom. Uh, two from the bottom is the EU average. So they're earning less than a third of just the average in the European Union. It says at the bottom they're making 5,000 euro per year. And the euro is right now just about on par with our dollar. So imagine making $5,000 a year, whereas your counterparts across the European Union, like the Netherlands at the very top and the UK and Germany and Ireland, they're doing quite well. This doesn't set well. Um, so that's Poland. Let's look at Hungary. Okay, so... Um, the guy you need to know here is Prime Minister Viktor Orban, um, who is the gentleman there on the right. And he is the head of the political party known as Fidesz, the Hungarian Civic Party. There is also a party further to the right, the radical right, called Jobbik, uh, the movement for a better Hungary. And together, these two parties control most of the National Assembly in Hungary. Uh, Fidesz has been the majority party since 2010. They won a supermajority in parliament in 2014 and 2018. And it has its roots back in the 1980s um, push to overthrow communism. So you see here this poster on the left, okay, which is an old um, late 1980s poster for Fidesz, which basically is saying, which do you want more of? Do you want more of the good old days of communism? You see uh, Brezhnev and, and Eric Honecker kissing there, these two former Soviet top heads of state. Um, or do you want something different? And they've got the couple down below. And actually, Orban himself was a young man and was a member of this political party trying to overthrow communism, trying to provide an alternative. That was great. But now, he proudly describes Hungary as a, quote, illiberal state. He touts himself and the European Union as, or excuse me, he touts himself and Hungary as saving Europe from itself. He calls it suicidal liberalism. And this is particularly regarding the refugee crisis in Europe. He has built a razor wire fence on the southern border in 2015 to keep the refugees from the Middle East out. Again, the, the pathway that they would take on their way to Germany and beyond is straight through these countries and um, hitting Hungary. Um, he calls Hungary, he says Hungary should be for the Hungarians only. He hates multiculturalism. He ingratiates himself with Vladimir Putin. Um, actually, in all four of these countries except for Poland, Putin is more popular than Donald Trump. He is also openly anti-Semitic um, and anti-Roma, which is a, a minority group in East Central Europe. Um, you may have heard of them as the gypsies, which is a derogatory term for them. So he's openly against them. Well, he passed um, some alarming laws in 2017. Uh, one being to, he restricted the work of foreign-funded non-government organizations and he hampered the operation of Central European University in Budapest. So the aim here by Orban and the Fidesz party is to delegitimize any independent voices that are critical of the government. They claim that only those elected by the popular majority, being Fidesz and Jobbik parties, have the right to speak to the public about um, issues of interest. Okay, so if you weren't elected, you don't get to 
challenge our opinion or speak. Now, Article 7 proceedings um, are also being initiated against Hungary. Um, there's, no, there's been no decisions made yet, and that is because currently these sanctions require a unanimous vote of the 28 heads of state in the European Union. Okay, and of course, Poland and Hungary have sworn that if sanctions are taken against their buddy, they'd be happy to veto down those sanctions. So what is just happening now, it's actually quite interesting to watch, is um, in January, two months ago, the European Commission, which is the executive branch of the European Union, put forth a resolution that would allow the commission itself, that executive branch, to approve and apply sanctions. Okay, um, But uh, the concern is that there's European parliamentary elections coming in May, and the populists are expected to make big gains. Um, actually, Orban's party is one of, um, is a member of one of the largest parties in the European Parliament. So if the populists make big gains in May, chances are that this new resolution where you could apply sanctions without unanimous approval, it will be shelved. So, so we will see, we'll see what happens there. All right, well, let's keep going. And let's talk about how did these problems arise. Okay. So in a nutshell, the 2008 economic crisis, as well as the refugee crisis, <laughs> followed by the ensuing security crises, led to the rise of these far-right parties um, and their protectionist narrative. And this information actually comes from a sociologist at UCLA named Rogers Brubaker, who's very um, well respected. He notes a couple things that are interesting, and one being a background piece of this puzzle, being that the party systems across Europe, from West to Eastern Europe, are definitely weakened. Um, party loyalty is down, party membership is down. Um, even a, lo a lot of the large political parties that used to be, you know, big contenders are no longer contenders. So this allows these new far right-wing parties to, they don't have to speak to a certain constituency. They address huge portions of the population, okay? And we always ask when, when you see the rise of far right-wing parties like this, you wonder, well, what's wrong with the other parties, right? Why are, why are the right-wing gaining such traction? What happened to the mainstream parties, okay? So you're always kind of keeping that in the back of your mind. And part of that, part of the far right's appeal is this painful transition to a free market economy. Okay, um, how many of you remember the TV show Dallas? Dallas, okay. So you had the rich Texan JR and his mansions and swimming pools and cars. And well, this TV show actually, um, you could pipe this in. If you lived on the western edge of the Iron Curtain, and I'm trying to get my little timer back here. Here we go. Um, if you lived on the western edge of the Iron Curtain, you could sometimes pipe in the Dallas TV show coming out of Vienna, for example, okay? And so the thinking was in the 80s, gee, if we transition to capitalism, we're going to look like JR. You know, we're going to have homes and pools and cars. We're not going to live in these communist block apartment buildings. Um, and here we are 30 years later, and it's painfully not the case. Um, I'd say 85, 90% of the population from Bratislava, Slovakia to Vladivostok lives in communist bloc apartments still. Um, and, and I did as well while I was there. I'll show you in just a minute a picture. Um, so they're very disillusioned. Um, you've got to work hard. There's no more communist handouts for marginal labor. Wages are low, prices are high. Uh, inequality. Some people have more than others. They didn't used to see that, really. Um, for the most part, there was the top echelon that always had more, but for the most part, everybody had the same. You didn't have to keep up with the Joneses. And now, that is very much a part of life. Um, in fact, during privatization, the former communists got rich quick. Um, they escaped with golden parachutes, you could say. And this is very frustrating um, to the average person. Corruption is rampant in this region. It's not uncommon 
to be expected to pay a bribe to your doctor when you're in the examination room for him to do his job. Um, it's not uncommon for professors to let it be known what the going rate is to pass the next exam. Um, I mean, this is honest stuff I've, I've seen. So corruption is just everywhere, let alone the political class, okay? So voter turnout is down because they just say, who do we choose? You know, they're all corrupt. Unemployment, also a problem, which really they didn't see under communism. They didn't see people um, on the streets. And this really troubles a lot of the older generation, which is the generation that gets to the polls and votes. So those who do vote are often of that 65 and older generation that truly remember life under communism and miss it. Um, this nostalgia, um, according to a 2018 Globesec study, approximately 33% of Europeans in Central Europe think life was better under communism. Okay, so 30 years on, 33% of people in this region think life was better under communism. Okay, this is a very, you, you hear this all the time, this kind of nostalgia. And here's a, a quote here from Vladimir Tismanyanu, who's a political scientist um, at University of Maryland. He's a very well-respected uh, Romanian-American uh, scholar. He says, in much of the post-communist world, the landscape is one of disenchantment, uncertainty, and cynicism. The initial times of post-communist euphoria are over. And you see on the left, that was the last block of flats where I lived. Um, so again, most people are still um, living in places like that. They're not quite in the Dallas homes yet. Well, I, I mentioned kind of a formula at the beginning. Um, I hesitate to put up formulas because it's too simplistic, but um, just to get through some material tonight, I will mention a few things that really are triggering the rise of these parties. And the first being there, that economic crisis. Um, the 2008 crisis, which played out a bit differently and a bit more drastically in Europe than it did here. Um, you might remember the sovereign debt crisis, uh, the threat to the euro currency in the EU itself, uh, the Greek bailout and austerity measures. Again, um, countries like these are being forced to bail out um, their Greek neighbors in the EU, and they're making $5,000 a year, and that did not set well with them. Um, so this was happening at the same time as, again, an increase in the gap between rich and poor, uh, the collapse of manufacturing jobs. In other words, lower skilled workers were losing their jobs, again, striking that older generation and the cross-border flow of labor, good, and services. Globalization was on the uptick, okay? So they're losing their jobs to these new this newfangled wave of globalization, and this is, this is very frustrating. Well, secondly, we had the refugee crisis, um, <clears throat> and this is tied in part to the economic crisis. Again, the migrants were seen as a threat to, quote, our jobs, our welfare fund, and the, the crisis stemmed from the EU's directive in 2015. You remember Angela Merkel in Germany said basically all EU member states are required to take a quota of refugees, okay? So there wasn't necessarily, they were not asked nicely what they thought. This was a top-down directive, okay? So they didn't like that to begin with because they don't like great powers telling them what to do. But um, here's some reasons why. First of all, these four countries say, look, we don't have the colonial guilt that Germany and Belgium and France did. We didn't have colonies in Africa and the Middle East, okay? So we don't feel a sense of owing anything to these people who were downtrodden. In fact, we were the little guys, right, who were being part of somebody else's empire. Um, and secondly, they say, look, we've seen this before. Um, we don't want to be told again what to do by another great power. We've struggled our whole existence to be independent states. Um, so they really did not like this. They also said, look, we don't want our hard earned money and welfare benefits going to freeloaders, um, especially those of another religion. So Muslim refugees, um, this leads to the rise of xenophobia in the region. And um, the V4 leaders responses, uh, were they pushed back against this refugee quota. 
Hungary's Viktor Orban said, uh, the truly serious threat comes not from the war zones, but from the depths of Africa. Uh, Poland's head of law and justice party said he described the refugees as bringing disease to Poland. Robert Fico, the former Slovak prime minister, refused to accept Muslims into Roman Catholic Slovakia. And the Czech president, Miloš Zeman, said the Muslim Brotherhood had organized the migration crisis, quote, to gain control of Europe. Okay, so this was all very um, cast in a negative light. And on top of this, this was followed by the security crises, okay, meaning the terror attacks that hit the European capitals and major cities after 2015. Um, so they, they argue really that Look, if you, Germany and France and Belgium, if you can't keep terror at bay with all of your money and intelligence and police forces, how do you expect us to, okay? And here's a map that shows um, some incidents of terrorism in Europe since, or in 2016, and the red being attacks, whether they were completed, failed, or foiled, and the blue being arrests for terrorist offenses. And if you can see, none of our four countries have had attacks yet, but certainly they have happened in Western Europe. And so these little guys say, how can we keep this at bay? Very much use that um, as a card to increase their stature. Well, there is um, one theory that I particularly gravitate towards for why this is happening, and that is put forward by a a Greek political scientist, she's actually at the University of Reading in England, um, Daphne Halikiopolo, and she talks about civic nationalism. She says that instead of merely responding to popular demand, these far-right parties are actually shaping it, and that's what's boosting their rise. She says they do so by adopting a particular type of nationalism, and that is civic nationalism. Two features according to Daphne, um, this presents culture as a value issue, so ideological rather than biological. In other words, we exclude people not because they're ethnically different, but because they constitute a real danger to the stability and security of our society. Okay, so using that perceived link between immigration and terrorism. Okay. Secondly, this presents welfare or entitlements um, as an important dimension of the social contract between states and citizens. She says, the collective goods of the state should be reserved for those who are part of that national solidarity pact. And because resources are scarce, outsiders should be excluded. Um, so she links immigration to access to jobs and to welfare, okay? And again, remember, these countries, these four that we're talking about, they were never asked to take a quota of refugees. This was a top-down mandate um, coming out of Germany for the most part. So this kind of thinking allows parties with exclusionary agendas to appear legitimate to a broad section of the population. Um, and in some, these parties use nationalism to capitalize on immigration by presenting it as a value problem that constitutes a safety threat and an economic problem that constitutes a job threat um, and a potential drain on the welfare fund, okay? So she says here, the role of nationalism <clears throat> is in the attempt and ability to seize the opportunities created by economic and political insecurities through an appealing rhetoric that is careful to distance itself from race and focus instead on values and voluntaristic criteria of national membership. So she argues civic nationalism does not shield from extremism. It actually makes societies more vulnerable to extremism by disguising it as populism. Okay. All right. Well, we've made it to number four. Let's move on to the larger trends in the region. Um, the first being the east-west divide within Europe. Um, Western Europe, France and Germany, for example, versus Eastern Europe, which are our four countries, plus Bulgaria, Romania. Um, there's a divide over Germany and France, quote, dictating policy to these smaller nations. There's a divide over cultural issues, multiculturalism, gay rights, abortion. 
Um, these four definitely see the EU as pushing a progressive cultural agenda on them. Um, so, and there's, there's also a divide actually over the EU budget. Um, and that's what's coming up is if the EU decides to impose sanctions on Poland and Hungary, the danger is that this fits well into the far right narrative, right? That Brussels is taking away the money that they've been giving us. Who else should we turn to? And that's our second point there is Russian influence, the, the fear that they would look to Russia again for assistance. Um, <coughs> Russia's influence, uh, much too briefly, is incredible. I was shocked when I was um, preparing for this as to what's going on in social media, in the media over there. I actually talked with, messaged with a few friends who live there to find out what's really going on, what are they seeing on the internet, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. So their influence via, whoops, so Russian influence, um, via the media and social media. Social media is fast becoming the most important source of information for Central Europeans. Uh, its impact comparable to that of television. Um, Hungary, for example, is characterized by the presence of pro-Russian disinformation in its mainstream media. Okay, so all of these have state media that you would see, Magyar television, which would be Hungarian television, Slovak TV, STV1, STV2. Okay, so you all have these mainstream channels that have been respected and trusted, and now they are really being hijacked. For example, the state news agency in Hungary, um, it's called MTI, has referred to the separatists in eastern Ukraine as a legitimate state and blamed the United States for the en masse death of civilians in Syria. Okay. Another example from Slovakia, there's an extreme right journal there which has called for Slovakia to withdraw from NATO. Okay. So a lot of these have an online presence and they have a, a physical published presence as well. So they're planting ideas via the internet. This all leads to conspiracy theories, um, which are very ripe in that part of the world. Actually, a majority um, in these V4 countries do not believe in the attempts by foreign actors to influence the outcome of democratic elections in the US or Europe. They see that as well as a complete another conspiracy theory. Well, finally, um, we see here anti-Semitism. And this is a very um, sad, unbelievable um, phenomenon, really, that's going on in this part of the world, considering that this is right dead center where the Holocaust um, took place. Uh, in 2018, just this time last year, Poland instated a new Holocaust law. And this says it is a crime to suggest that Poles were complicit themselves in any wartime atrocities against the Jews, okay? So it's literally a crime punishable by fine or up to three years in prison to say that the Poles themselves might have had anything to do with it, okay? Um, and uh, this is just uh, very sad. Um, Poland, although has long identified as one of the biggest victims of World War II, and from the Polish point of view, um, I'll give you some statistics. We know that six million Poles died in World War II. Six million Poles died in World War II. Three million of them were Jewish, okay? Almost half the Jews killed in the Holocaust. We also know that the Soviets sat on the other side of the Vistula River while the Nazis burned Warsaw to the ground during the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. They literally <laughs> sat there. They were coming in to rescue the Poles, the Soviets were, but they let the Germans get a head start um, by just burning Warsaw to the ground. So if you go to Warsaw today, um, it has been completely rebuilt. Um, the death toll in that failed Warsaw uprising of 1944 was higher than that of the victims in Hiroshima, Japan, after the atomic bomb. So you, you can see this tension between Poles seeing themselves as uh, victims, major victims of World War II, and uh, not wanting to be blamed for anything having to do with the Holocaust. Um, well, the recent spark for this was a book recently published um, by a Princeton scholar, um, Jan Gross, it's called Neighbors. He himself is of Polish Jewish ancestry. And he offers compelling evidence, very compelling evidence, that the Poles themselves 
committed some of these atrocities during World War II. So this has totally um, shaken things up. All right, well, why does it matter? Why does it matter to us? First of all, and yes, we're on number five, we're almost done. Um, first of all, there has been little censure so far from the European Union and their elections are approaching, okay? Um, as I mentioned, Orban's Hungarian party is part of the largest political grouping in the European Parliament right now. Uh, with the elections coming, the populists are expected to make big gains. So whether or not they will be able to pass this new resolution between now and May that would allow sanctions to be taken against these um, kind of rogue states um, remains to be seen. Um, secondly, if Poland and Hungary continue to get away with these actions, the entire EU and the Eurozone, being the single currency market, could weaken, okay? Um, so why? Well, the EU depends in large part on its ability to enforce judicial decisions consistently. And so if the Article 7 proceedings are not enforced on Poland or Hungary, it weakens the legitimacy of the European Union. It also makes it very difficult for the Eurozone, the single, current, uh, single currency market, to function in areas where the EU rules are not being enforced consistently. Okay, so the, the financial markets are worried if, if the rules aren't applying and we're just um, ignoring them. So the solvency of the euro itself comes into jeopardy. Now, if the euro and the EU weaken, um, this, of course, is a big hit to the U.S., both economically and culturally. Um, I actually heard an interview recently with former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. And he says, you know, the U.S. And, and Europe are likely going to need each other more and more in the future, especially in light of potential threats coming out of Russia, coming out of China. Um, he says, we actually have... Um, strong shared values, values in democracy, the rule of law, um, that are very important to keep, um, keep valid, okay? Um, so, that said, here's a quote, what happens in Warsaw or Budapest will also affect Paris and Berlin, and the sooner decision makers realize it, the better. Right? It's very much um, of concern to us. And, and the final reason why does it matter is the threat is there that these, these countries could pivot east instead, okay? Again, if the funds from the EU dry up to Poland and Hungary and these parties gain even more strength, they're already talking about being anti-Brussels, okay? This is not everyone in the country, but there's a significant portion of the populations in Poland and Hungary that question why they're in NATO, why they're in the European Union. So the question then becomes, if they leave these institutions, who do they turn to? Do they pivot east instead to Russia? Um, and the historical precedent for this would be Czechoslovakia, um, which was actually the only East European state not to be occupied by the Red Army after World War II. Okay, they were very careful. Stalin was careful actually with Czechoslovakia. It was kind of a pet project of democracy. So the Red Army liberated a good bit of it, but it did not occupy um, Czechoslovakia. And instead, in the free and fair elections of 1946, the Czechs and Slovaks voluntarily voted in a leftist, communist-led government into power. Okay, so those were free and fair elections in 1946, and Czechoslovakia votes in um, a leftist, communist-led government. They felt they'd been sold down the river at Munich in 1938 when Sudetenland was given to Hitler. The Red Army again had liberated much of their territory. They thought, let's give communism a try. So it's not like this hasn't happened before. So the question for us is, uh, will the European Union cave and just say this is the new normal? Um, or will they confront and overcome this illiberalism? Um, and enforce these sanctions against Poland and Hungary. So, okay, with that, I'm going to stop and take a few questions from Gerda. Thanks. Um, 
Okay. 